Hello everyone. The title of my today's talk is From Structural Analysis to Rosetta Stone A Multidisciplinary Paradigm of Decoding the Semasiographic Mercantile Script of Indus Civilization. I start my talk by thanking Professor Ishak Samejo, the Sindhi Language Authority and the Government of Sindh, Pakistan. I dedicate this presentation to the eminent archaeologist Jonathan Mark Kenoyer and the visionary language engineer Amar Fayez Buriro. This does not indicate that these scholars endorse my claims. Hopefully, this presentation supports the belief of Mr. Buriro and his colleagues that the ancient symbolisms hidden in our present languages will help us to decode in the script. Today, I shall show the decoding of the gold symbol and the gold measuring Ratti symbol of Indus script with the help of the touch stones and the gold testing needles used by ancient Indus goldsmiths. These findings are the culminating point of my nine years of research. Thus, in 45 minutes or so, I can only storm through them. So, I have written down the talk to save time. Now, when can we claim that Indus script or ISC is partly decoded? If we understand the basic mechanism through which ISC conveyed meanings, if we understand the main, main semantic scopes of Indescript, and if we can decode a few of Indescript signs with interlocking archaeological, linguistic, and symbolic evidence, then we may claim that Indescript is no more completely undeciphered. Now, the mechanism of ISC for conveying meaning was semasiography and or logography. In the script was written by signs which were meaning units, not sound units. This statement makes more than 90% of claimed decipherments of Indus script provably wrong as they treat Indus science as phonograms. So we should not join uh, Indus science by uh, treating uh, them as phonograms and you know, uh, uh, you know, joining their speculated sounds. These are you know meaning units and the meanings are joined to form a meaningful phrase. So, the domains of use uh, for Indescript was taxation, trade or craft licensing, commodity control and access control mainly. So, Indus stamps were possibly tax or license related stamps. You can see various structural parallels between modern stamps and Indus uh, seals and also there are various archaeological evidence for uh, that support these conjectures. And in the script, uh, uh, the in the inscribed tablets were licenses or permits uh, issued to tax collectors, traders, and artisans. So you, you see here, this is a modern trade license issued by the government of Sindh, which specifies license issuer and license type, etc. Similarly. Uh, the oversights of in the script tablets were possibly, you know, mentioning the type of taxes, tax commodities, or ta license graphs, those kind of information. And the reverse side, you know, numeral metrological kind of very typical inscriptions, they were possibly license fee or license slab. Now you can see that different segments of modern tax stamps generally encode different types of information and each segment can have specific types of acceptable text. For example, in these modern U.S. stamps, you can see that the type of stamp, that is beer stamp, that is written over here. Then the you know, standard measure of tax good, uh, that is a one by one six barrel or one eight barrel of beer, that will be in these places mentioned. And then I know different iconographies will be there, and the mode of tax payment, like rate of tax per measure of good those kind of things will be uh, mentioned in these uh, places and uh, you know the type of you know tax receiver in detail here it is internal revenue those kind of information here so each segment could have only a specific type of tax as you can see in a formalized data carrier 
Similarly, the formulaic index inscriptions can be segmented into certain parts. Each segment was usually populated by specific classes of signs that encoded information about, say, tax types and license types, modes of tax payment, tax rates and license fees, names of tax commodities and license commercial activities, types of tax collecting authorities such as rulers, treasury, uh, different type of uh, merchant guilds, etc. Now, after giving you a brief overview of my research findings, I come to the decoding part of specific indescript signs. That is the crucible inside, blood pipe inside crucible sign, uh, possibly for gold and goldsmithy, and the ratti or abras precatoria seed sign for indus carrot and treasury also. So this is a very important question to answer, like does Rinda script have a Rosetta stone? Indescript researchers have always wished to discover a multilingual document like the Rosetta stone or the uh, Behistun inscription which have helped the decipherments of Egyptian hieroglyphs and various cuneiform scripts. But Rosetta stones, in my opinion, need not always be multilingual documents. So imagine a situation when an intelligent extraterrestrial being comes to Earth after Earth is unfortunately destroyed along with most of its written staff. So the ET may try to guess the meaning of some of our symbols by the context of the symbols. So if she can guess the functionality of an electric switchboard by seeing its wires, etc., then she might also be able to guess the meaning of the energy radiating light bulb symbol engraved on it by analyzing its iconicity, that is radiating some energy kind of thing and synthetic symbolism and then its context that it occurs on a electric switchboard. So here the electric switchboard is a ET's Rosetta stone for decoding our bulb symbol. Similarly, I argue that IVC had certain inscribed artifacts which are not multilingual but can serve the very purpose of the Rosetta stones. So the following inscribed golden needles which were found from a jewelry hoard of Mohenjo-daro are the claimed Rosetta stones of Indescript. If we understand their functionality and collect, connect their fun inscriptions to that functionality, then we can decode two very important signs of Indescript. However, before doing that, let us see how gold assaying is done using touch stones so that we understand what are gold assaying needles. Now, touch stones, these are black sheet stones, have been used for testing gold's purity from time immemorial. When a goldsmith gets a gold sample of unknown purity, he rubs it on the stone to make a streak, say with a question mark here in a modern touch stone. Then he uses gold testing needles whose tips are made of gold alloys of known purity to make similar streaks of known purities on the touchstone. These needles are stamped with 10K, 14K, 18K, etc. as nowadays purity is measured by carat or K. So by comparing the colors of these streaks by naked eye, that is called calorimetric method, the goldsmith understands which carat value is closest to the unknown sample's purity. Nowadays, acids are also used in this test, but before 18th century, only calorimetric and haptic comparisons were used. Now, see how a modern jeweler of today's India, of my city Bangalore actually, is using the same touchstone method to test purity of gold. So, archaeologically, it is proven that IVC used touchstone method of testing gold. So, Indus people were making gold ornaments since at least 5th millennium BC. It is proven by a gold bead belonging to approximately 5th millennium BC discovered from Mehergarh. 
in the whole world one of the earliest archaeological evidence of tas stones with gold streaks comes from a jeweler's house excavated from ibisu settlement banawali one of the world's earliest written references about the use of tas stones is found in india's kautilya's arthashastra of c 400 bc tas stones are also reported from mohenjo-daro and lothar now till date archaeologists have not identified or discussed any gold testing needle kind of tool that were used along with these tas stones i humbly claim to have identified the gold testing needles of ibc so you can see that a 54.44 mm long copper rod with a gold tip was found from kota davadli that is a mature harappan settlement of gujarat archaeologist shirvalkar and rawat the excavators they have remarked that the use of this copper rod is still a question mark now what can be the use of a copper needle or stylus with a gold tip since the whole body of the needle or stylus is not made of gold here gold is not used for making a luxury item or a ritual item it is surely focused on the functionality of the needle or stylus is tip or nib so this artifact also is too blunt for being used as a piercing needle because we know sometimes you know gold tipped needles are used for ear piercing and all in india but it is not uh, suitable for that and also its shape with a like a smaller nib and the wider body suggests that it cannot be used as a sewing needle either because you see while go moving through the you know uh, cloth it will not uh, it will the movement will be obstructed by its shape so a single look at modern gold or silver testing needles which contain copper or bronze bodies and gold or silver tips should solve the puzzle so the kota de vergli's needle or stylus with a copper body and a gold tip was surely a gold assay needle used with tas stones now after you know identifying kota de vergli's uh gold assay needle we can actually easily identify mohenjo daro's gold testing needles so mohenjo daro's excavation reports mention a jewelry hoard found inside a large copper bowl covered by a shallow copper dish excavated from room 1 h house 1 in trench e of dk area so this hoard contained a very fine necklace made of carnelian beads two gold ear studs several bead caps made of gold of different purities an unfinished turquoise matrix fitted with caps of gold and electrum and there were three needle shaped objects made of gold whose functionality has puzzled scholars till date so this hoard also contained certain bronze vessels and a broken bronze sensor now mohenjo daro's gold needles are very similar in shape and size to ancient kota de vergli's gold testing needle and modern gold testing needles as you can see see the tip the body the copper body here the gold body it is and and uh, this is the tips are shouldered with this now we can prove that mohenjo daro's gold needles were found from a working goldsmith's hoard not a wealthy consumer's hoard so at the time of excavation the copper jar containing the jewelry hoard was so tightly attached to its lid that archaeologists had to cut it open hence the copper jar's contents were surely not scattered or lost yet the jar contains several golden bead caps without beads which are therefore surely raw materials procured for jewelry making an unfinished turquoise ornament is also found here hence this jewelry hoard must have belonged to a working goldsmith or jeweler not a wealthy consumer of jewelry the hoard also contained a fragmentary copper or bronze sensor which was possibly kept by the goldsmith as a source of refined copper in my opinion otherwise why will some uh, someone st uh, store a broken sensor and gold of different purities 
with an enormously expensive carlinian necklace or girdle you know various uh, uh, you know uh, experimental uh, work done by archaeologists vidale and kenar have proven how, what the amount of like you know uh, effort went into making such a big necklace of uh, carnelian beads or other precious stone beads so we can prove that mohenjo-daro's gold needles were used as gold testing tools by the goldsmith who owned the hoard and also the very you know expensive uh, carnelian uh, jewel, uh, you know necklace or girdle so these are uh, you know tools uh, not you know sellable items why so the gold of the bead caps of the hoard varies greatly in color ranging from almost copper red to pale yellow as maka has reported so the goldsmith must have procured the gold from different sources and surely had to test their purity using gold testing needles also according to maka two of the golden needles have evidently been held between the teeth on more than one occasion so it is evident that the goldsmith used the needles for his own work and held them between his teeth when his hands were you know engaged if the goldsmith intended to sell the gold needles as luxury items they would not have been so dented by use now you see like this modern carpenter with hands engaged and pen held in his mouth the mohenjo-daro goldsmith also possibly held the gold testing needles between his teeth which explains the tooth marks now what type of symbols are expected on gold testing and silver testing needles we expect information about the purity of gold or silver alloy that this that is like the nib of the needle which will be used for you know uh, assaying gold of an unknown purity so that is why you can see here 18k is written that is 18 by 24 purity 25 by 24 karat means 100 percent purity and uh, in a different convention for silver testing needles you can see 999s kind of things are written where it is not carrot that is mentioned but a numeral and the name of the metal that is silver here now since the ancient stone based assaying method has not changed much even today we can ex expect that ancient gold testing needles contain similar types of purity related expressions containing you know numerals names of gold measuring units and or names of precious metals such as you know gold silver electrum may be present in the alloy now let us compare the ancient and the modern needles so in this gold testing needles with the ratti sign and numerical symbol is very similar in nature with the numeral and carrot symbol on modern needles as i shall explain in next slides in india ratti is equivalent to carrot also another in this gold testing needle with Crucible blowpipe base, gold symbol and numeral symbols are very similar in nature with the 99.99% S type of text found on modern silver testing needles where the name of metal is you know mentioned. So the gold symbol is also decoded in the coming slides. Now you can see this is the Indus script sign that is also used in silks and tablets and also here we have found it on this gold testing needle and you can see this unmistakable similarity of this sign with the ratti seeds or abrus precatoria seeds which are also known by various name, names across India, India and uh, Pakistan of today. Now let us see the similarities between the Indic gold measuring ratti unit and the modern globally used gold measuring unit carrot. So this Indian ratti unit that is a traditional metrical unit used for weighing gold and gemstones and measuring gold purity is based on the weights of abrus precatoria seeds and the modern carrot or carrot unit which is also in a very ancient unit is a popular metrical unit for measuring or weighing gold gemstones and gold purity and it was also uh, originally based on the weights of carob seeds so these are both ancient 
seed based units till that used to measure gold gemstone and gold purity you know why seeds are used because it's not possible to you know make so many of you know uh, very small weights very difficult so uh, seeds can give that granular measurement of like a very different type of ornaments and all so goldsmiths have to use that granular measurement that is why seeds are very important in uh, gold's metrology so as recorded in Arthashastra in ancient India, the equivalent of carrot was indeed the ratti seeds because these uh, ratti seeds were also called kakani in ancient India and these were used as a measure of purity of 16 different alloys of gold and copper as uh, described in Arthashastra that is Shora Shavarnaka gold. Now, Kakani was one of the popular ancient names of Ratti seeds and it is repeatedly mentioned as a gold measuring unit in Arthashastra, like for the weighing the gold ornaments and all. So therefore, 24 by 24 carat of today was equivalent to 16 by 16 Kakani or Ratti in ancient India. Now, you see, as confirmed by archaeologists, the Ratti seed was also the basis of IPC system of standardized weights, most of which were small range weights suitable for measuring precious metals or gemstones. Now, you see in this needle, we can consider it as a special type of rosette stone because its functionality of gold measuring and its inscription having the numerals and gold measuring unit of ancient India, they are very closely matching. So they, it really helps for us to decode the Indus carat sign by the functionality and context, just like the you know electric switchboard hypothetical situation of ET. Also see that in the Indo-Pakistani idioms such as Main tumhe ratti bhar bhi vishwas nahi karti Like ratti bhar means minimum. I don't have minimum trust in you. In here in the civilizations minimum weight unit ratti is getting used as a linguistic symbol for minimum. That shows what the ancient you know <clears throat> root of our uh, linguistic idioms and our languages you know. So in uh, your opinion, this Indrascript sign is decoded or not? Now I move on to the gold symbol of Indrascript. So many uh, scholars have identified this sign as a mortar pestle symbol, but I identify it, <coughs> sorry, and it's allographs, uh, these are allographs as a symbol of a blue pipe inside a crucible by considering the following evidences. So there is a very you know, uh, close visual similarity if you see that pestles will not have this kind of a, you know, uh, structure because pestles will be uh, having a uniform uh, cylindrical or conical you know, structure normally so that we can you know, pound it properly and all. But here you can see that this is kind of a stick or you know a pipe and this is like something attached to it ovoid so you see in blow pipes this reed uh, pipe will be there or pipe made of reeds or you know sometimes animal haunt also uh, in ancient times and here there will be you know clay uh, made or uh, this kind of a uh, structure to protect the tip from fire so this is the blow pipe this is a crucible uh, a very important uh, you know corroboration comes from this sign here you see this is a graphically related sign where a fire like symbol is drawn below the grapheme which strongly indicates the vessels association with fire so it is a crucible really and it supports the crucible blow pipe hypothesis now why did indus people you know use a crucible and a blow pipe symbol uh, for signifying gold so since crucibles and blow pipes are very important tools for goldsmiths also for metalsmiths but goldsmiths especially because they have while soldering and all those things you know to you know they have to pinpoint the uh, the place where through the blow pipe where the the melting point should be high like there like which part should be 
specifically melted so goldsmiths have been using you know crucible blow pipe for a long time even today in some other form that is why traditionally goldsmiths are always shown with crucibles and blow pipes you can see these pictures also you can see in 2452 to 2350 bc uh, relief from tomb of maniruka in egypt uh, goldsmiths are shown to uh, blow inside crucibles using blow pipes and these are some uh, Indus Valley crucibles, the pictures. Now, in multiple ancient scripts and ancient languages, words and symbols for goldsmiths and goldsmithy or metalsmithy are associated to the crucible blowpipe symbolism. You can see uh, here it is a this is a uh, you know picture adapted from Rechmeyer's uh, tomb painting of Egypt again depicting a uh, goldsmith sitting and blowing with a blowpipe inside a crucible and another hand is he, with is uh, holding a pincer or something you know um, that is possibly the gold piece that is getting melted is held by his hand or here so you see this picture is so similar to these ideograms or semantic classifiers used in Egyptian hieroglyph uh, writing and uh, you know why they were used they were used as ideograms or semantic classifiers uh, beside the uh, you know uh, Egyptian hieroglyphic words uh, for smelter foundryman gold worker goldsmith metal worker gold working smelting wo metal working so in all these words this kind of man blowing inside uh, a crucible using a blowpipe that ideogram is used similarly in the mesopotamian Akkadian language nph i don't know how to pronounce it uh, means to blow or to fan or fire or to set a place you know and nappahu means below nappatu means blowpipe and nappahu means smith in Akkadian language see the etymological relationship between blowing blowpipe and smithy words similarly in the Sumerian script Simug meant smith which was also originally written with a complex pictograph comprising a smith's fire pictograph and a foreman who is like you know uh, setting the fire ablaze similarly in Indian Dravarian Indo Aryan languages, you know, across in various Indic languages, the words for, you know, uh, goldsmiths are very directly related to the word for blow by blower. It's like Mayaka means blower, that is mentioned as one type of artisans in uh, goldsmith's workshop in Arthashastra. Then Telugu Narindhamuru, Sanskrit Narindhama, Pali Nalindhama these dictionaries are all you know mentioning this specific word for goldsmith uh, which is like nari or nali is pipe dhamma dhamuru etc means one who blows so blow pipe blower is goldsmith in these languages similarly dravarian udu means to blow with the breath of uh, breath or with pillows and udu also means to refine gold with the help of a blow pipe in Dravarian languages, kompu, kommu, kombu, etc. mean horn, pipe, or bugle, and komu, karo means horn blower, and ko, that is ply blower or blow pipe blower, and then komu, eruvaru means um, goldsmith, uh, karmakar that is coming from this komu, karu word that is again bellow blower or blow pipe blower. That is uh, the, an harpa Sanskritized word today, which which means. Uh, you know blacksmith and uh, kamar that is also getting used in uh, today's uh, various Indo-Aryan languages which is possibly coming from this Dravarian word uh, related to blowpipe uh, blower or bellow blower so you see several crucibles have been also found from IVC with the traces of copper and bronze. For example, Mehirgar, Harappa, Manjadaro, Karyakkiyari, Kanmer, Guladoro, Lothal, Dholavira, Guladavadli, various settlements. And then two small copper crucibles were possibly used by goldsmiths found from Kalibangan as, as per Bibilal, the excavator. 
and Marshall has mentioned to metalsmith's blow pipes found in vicinity of some copper and gold mint jewelry items in Mohenjo-daro, though Kenoir has questioned that identification. However, blow pipes being made of perishable materials are scantily found in archaeological remains across the world. But since crucibles were used, blow pipes must have been used in IVC because without blow pipes, you know, uh, you could not have smelted um, or melted, uh, you know, uh, metals inside a crucible. So here you see again, uh, this crucible blowpipe based gold symbol comes on another, uh, you know, gold assay needle of uh, Mahanjodaro. And here this uh, text, I believe, signified proportions of gold and other metals present in the alloy. Uh, so uh, this uh, sign is very infrequent. We don't know which what will be the meaning of this, but the, this is a gold sign. There's a numeral kind of thing also. And then there is this double crescent sign with some ivory type of uh, or task like protrusion. So, uh, you know, this double crescent sign could have uh, uh, actually meant uh, some other type of uh, metal also because in, in the uh, you know, seals and uh, tablets, this sign has often, uh, you know, occurred with um, the, uh, you know, go, uh, crucible blowpipe based gold, uh, gold related uh, signs. And if, uh, if we uh, uh, think about it actually because of the color silver is all often you know compared to moon and in india today uh, the word chandi that is a most popular word even in various places of pakistan i think uh, for silver so chandi is coming from chandra that is uh, chandrika chandra that is moon or moonlight and uh, so maybe a similar cinematogram was used which uh, showed the moon like you know crest double crescent and maybe electrum was also present in the hoard so this task like protrusion this might uh, be a ivory uh, kind of uh, modifier which possibly means you know white or pale because you know electrum is often uh, you know uh, described as a pale gold etc so these are not very sure conjectures but the identification of the crucible blowpipe symbol as a gold symbol is uh, possibly a very um, uh, in having an interlocking evidence for the deco decoding we have. Now I claim that in the taxation and licensing related in the seals and tablets, this crucible blow pipe sign signified gold and goldsmithy as names of tax commodity and license craft. Possibly the collocation where this crucible blow pipe based gold sign always occurs with three stroke numeral kind of signs, but the numeral signs do not follow, uh, do not precede the, uh, the cinematogram as normally uh, happens in industry, but it follows the cinematogram. So this is a fixed kind of collocation, which possibly signified uh, meanings like those three precious metals, like dhatutraya, sometimes we use, uh, say in Indian languages nowadays, dhatutraya, Traya means three, so those three, so three precious metals might have been signified by this kind of an expression, maybe, you know, gold, sim, uh, silver, and possibly maybe tin or bronze, I'm not sure. Interestingly, the gold sign often occurs with cinematograms and logograms that possibly represented goldsmith's assay valences and signified tax names and license names related to goldsmithy. Now, this might be a bit difficult to, you know, uh, comprehend uh, without context. So, uh, let us discuss industry's metrology-based metrology based taxation metonymy before we move on to the next slides which discuss the gold sign and the asset balance related signs. So you know in ancient civilizations names of taxes were very often related to names of vessels with, with capacities of standardized or volumetric units and names of weights of standardized weight units. As such vessels and weights were you often used for tax or license fee collection and resource redistribution. So we have examples from not only ancient Egypt, ancient Mesopotamia, but also from ancient historical India about this metrology based 
Mijonimi for tax related terms. For example, in ancient India, the, uh, the uh, unit drona that meant a wooden vessel, a volumetric unit, and then drona mukha meant a type of revenue center, drona bappa meant the amount of land required to sow one drona of seed, and then certain tax collectors were called drona mapaka, that is, who measures with drona. You know, because they are measuring grains with this drona kind of a vessel to collect taxes. So people call them drona mapaka. Okay, so here a volumetric unit and the name of a vessel is getting used as the name of a tax collector designation or name of a revenue center, drona mukha. Similarly, in uh, ancient uh, Mesopotamia, Sutu uh, was a measurement unit, a vessel's name and a, a type of name of tax and a Sutu moment also in you know, a storehouse or you know where tax can be collected if, uh, uh, and Sata moment you know uh, the storehouses you know supervisor like Drona Mukha the storehouse Sutumu Satamu Drona Mapaka you can have this direct parallel because the system is similar not because the languages were similar or not because people were you know learning from each other about this symbolism the system was so similar they they, they uh, the linguistic symbolism also uh, came from the same system and had this familiarity you know similarly uh, the link based in tax terms are raju gaha ka amacha uh, mentioned in uh, our Jataka uh, text, you know. So Raju means rope, and Raju Gahaka Macha means who uh, you know measured land with Raju, so that uh, they, uh, how how much is the land measured and how much should be ta the tax amount of grain that that measurement could be done. So similarly in Egypt, rope bearer, bearer or rope stretcher. You see Raju Gahaka Macha of India and rope bearer or rope stretcher uh, in Egyptian language. Languages, that also meant uh, uh, some, some type of tax collectors in ancient Egypt. You know, uh, similarly, you know, uh, dharana means, you know, to hold or to bear in shoulder. And dharana is our weight unit. Dharana has been also used as different um, taxation, uh, tax-based, you know, metrological unit. And then... Um, in India, skandhaka means a tax, uh, or skandha means bearing load uh, yeah, on uh, a shoulder yoke. Uh, that is, skandhaka is the tax uh, that is on the shoulder load how much tax is collected in ancient historical India. So this, this means that these kind of terms can have a very direct graphical uh, relationship with various indescript science, say jar-based science, uh, which are uh, indescript terminal science, and also the load bearer science, which are indescript terminal science. So these signs were all meteorological symbols, you know, which actually possibly, uh, you know, um, uh, express different tax types or license types as I have argued in some of my art articles. Now I come to the arrow sign which uh, which comes very frequently with the gold or precious metal uh, symbols uh, or sign sequences in Indescript. See the arrow sign is coming very frequently with the precious metal related uh, uh, sign sequences. Now you see uh, I am arguing that in India, ancient India, because assay balance or goldsmith's balance had this arrow-like pointer, which uh, ha was important for me measuring, uh, you know, very accurately the weights of precious metals. So from that symbolism, you know, in various Indic uh, uh, languages like uh, Telugu and uh, Indo-Aryan language, Sanskrit, Dravidian language, Telugu, you know, Arrow words are getting used as words for goldsmith's balance. Like Narachamu means an arrow, an instrument to cut gold, and also goldsmith balance because of this arrow symbolism of assay balance. Similarly, <clears throat> sorry, similarly, Asian means arrow, Asian means goldsmith's balance, Naraj, arrow, Naraji, goldsmith's balance. So, this is uh, a very interesting symbolism, and we know that uh, from archaeological evidence that in, in this civilization 
uh, as a balances with arrow pointers I have uh, been used you know in an uh, excavation uh, report done uh, of Kenwara of Mount Def of Harappa uh, two sets of scale pans with uh, bronze cross beams hook chain and a broken arrow shape pointer were found I had once communicated with um, Kenwara about the possible usage of the pointer and he uh, at least in that uh, private email communication that time uh, I did not uh, know about uh, the other significance but I was just curious and he said that yes as point arrow pointer was possibly used in uh, the weighing balance um, uh, for measuring uh, the precious metal metal accurately so interestingly the same symbolism possibly have been used uh, for assay uh, assay balances and from there possibly a metonymical precious commodity related you know tax name came up uh, which always you know happened to occur along with the precious metal uh, uh, signs in Indus tax related and license related seals and tablets interestingly a scale pan of like as a scale pan of as a balance type of uh, symbol that is a terminal sign again uh, is occurring uh, only with gold symbol not on not with any other kind of symbol and only are found in tablets till now so you can see this this, this symbol comes in the terminal position uh, preceded by various allographs of the crucible blowpipe gold symbol so uh, it is possible that here this also sim, uh, you know sig signified the actual asset balance and you know maybe uh, signified some permit for goldsmithy or you know permit for trading with you know uh, maybe um, uh, uh, gold bullions or something like that you know so actually similar looking uh, symbols of scale pans have been again used in linear b and linear a scripts of ancient greece to signify metrology related meanings so this kind of symbolism have been used in ancient uh, scripts because of not because they were the ancient people were communicating with each other uh, from different civilizations but because they were thinking alike because they had a similar type of tools and similar type of technological advancement uh, at different point of time now there is a further confirmation of the gold and in the scattered science identification as discussed in my other articles we have already said that the you know uh, press final terminal science or meteorological symbols used for uh, uh, you know metonymi metonymically signifying tax or license types right so you see when the commodity types uh, change uh, from crop or livestock based science like possibly plant or animal based products to gold you see here this see these are very similar inscriptions right this this sign then uh, commodity type sign and then terminal signs so when the commodity sign changes from this type of signs to gold then the terminal uh, sign that is meteorological symbol for tax type that changes from you know the, uh, the jar sign or load bearer sign to uh, uh, ratti based symbol you see this is a clearly a ratti related symbol with uh, some modification a uh, small mark here so this I think cannot be a coincidence um, these are really interlocking evidence about our um, Ratti uh, identification and gold sign identification I shall now argue that the Ratti symbol uh, had its meanings extended in uh, certain places of Indus script for example in the pre-connective positions of composite Indus inscriptions the Ratti signs possibly you know signified treasury you know treasuries uh, that is tax collection center where tax collection is um, done normally uh, in terms of you know precious metals and other like gemstones and other precious commodities so you, you see tax related seals found from Seleucia on Tigris later and uh, on uh, our Elamite administrative seals have also sometimes mentioned treasury related words and symbols because treasury is a very important concept in the semantic domain of taxation and licensing 
now you also see the rati and arrow symbol so if as i said the arrow is possibly as a balance related symbolism rati is again another gold measuring related symbol right so these are also coming as tax types or license types in the similar in, in similar positions in in the inscriptions you know uh, they are having a type of you know equal balance with each other so that is also another interesting script internal evidence about uh, the uh, goldsmithy related metrical symbols of ivc now uh, the ratti symbol very and another symbol that is sim, uh, very similar graphically and combinatorically uh, with this this ratti symbol i think either they are used as allographs but because brian wells and andreas fools have uh, also argued that in certain in, in one inscription they have you uh, the buddha uh, signs have uh, occurred in the same inscription maybe they uh, when not as allographs they were also used used as cement related sign with nuanced meanings but the same basic meaning and the basic meaning was that uh, gold measuring ratti unit that meaning now the meaning might have got extended in the pre connective positions of composite inscriptions now you see certain signs frequently uh, occur or like dominate the pre connective segments of composite indus inscriptions as discussed in my some other articles and uh, these signs most possibly signified certain types of tax collecting or license issuing administrative departments rulers and guilds why i say so because you see uh, the considering indo pakistani symbolic tradition of using wheels as royal symbols uh, throughout history many scholars have argued that in the scripts we like uh, pre connective symbol could have you know uh, signified royalty or ruling body so similarly you know uh, the other symbols also can be you know explained in various ways i'll not go into details here but you see uh, this uh, ratti sit symbol and it's uh, modified another grapheme these occur very frequently in the same pre connective position which is you know hypothesized uh, for uh, encoding uh, you know tax collecting entity types now you see new Numismatic symbols have always been used as symbols of treasury across the world. So you can see today, uh, the new, if you search treasury and go to uh, Google and search treasury and go to images, you see this uh, currency symbols will be always uh, there as symbols of treasury. So ratti was the basis of Indus weights, which were used to collect taxes in forms of precious metals, right? So precious metal um, uh, bullions have been actually thought about. you know uh, the precursor of um, coins uh, in uh, in you know uh, abstract money money less societies barter based societies and also ratti remained the basis of numismatics in later historical india many of our panchmark coins they are based on they were based on ratti unit their un weights were based on ratti unit and also their names were based on different names of uh, the ratti sets you see in even in uh, vedic texts krishnala is mentioned as one type of possible uh, you know, gold coin krishnalam 